Well, welcome again, and thank you for the first joining us for the first formal installment in the series on uh, the Father and Son Wine Scheme. And for our kickoff today, I want to start off with a very important scripture, which is in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. And I want to read it to you from the Amplified Version. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he shall turn and reconcile the hearts of the estranged fathers to the ungodly children and the hearts of the rebellious children to the piety of their fathers. A reconciliation produced by repentance of the ungodly, lest I come and smite the land with a curse and a ban of utter destruction. Now, if you look at the scripture, you will find that there's a reconciling and a turning of the hearts that takes place in the hearts of fathers that has been estranged from ungodly children, and even in the hearts of the rebellious children to come to a place in a position where they reconcile with righteous fathers. Uh, scripture that where this is actually duplicated in the New Testament can be found in Luke 1 verse 17 and it says and I'm also reading from the Amplified Version and it says and he will himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and incredulous and unpursuable to the wisdom of the upright which is the knowledge and holy love of the will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, adjusted and disposed and placed in the right moral state. This verse actually takes it a step further, where the whole concept of preparing a people, a righteous people, in a right moral state, unto the Lord. And this is what the Father-Son wine scheme is, is all about. Now in both of these scriptures we see there is a specific function that is allocated to the spirit of Elijah that does a, a very specific work in the hearts of both the Father and of the Son. Now if you go right back to the very beginning of creation, we see that Adam was separated from his father, and at, sorry, and as sin greatly increased fatherlessness, also ultimately became the defining condition of man and the earth. Today we see broken families. We see that the role of the father and the authority of the father is totally being usurped. Um, there is an absent father. Now, the good news that I want to share with you in this series is that in this time we see God is sending restoration to the family through the spirit of Elijah because the intent of God is to restore at the end of the day the relationship between God and between man. I invite you to turn with me also to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 to 20. And uh, again, I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. And then it continues in verse 18 and it says, But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, that by word and deed we might, might aim to bring others into harmony with him. It was God personally pre present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation of the restoration 
to fame. So verse 20 tells us clearly, so we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal as it were through us, and that we as Christ's personal representatives beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor now offered to you and be reconciled to God. So if we look at this, we see that the role and the function of the spirit of Elijah was to bring reconciliation between the Jews and that of their godly forefathers. And by fulfilling this function, the end outcome or the result is restoration unto God as father of the nation of Israel. Now here's the question. How could we, in fact, be given a message of reconciliation? And how could we then be permitted to reconcile men unto God? Now, when we speak of the gospel in the churches today, we're not speaking a gospel of reconciliation. If you listen to what's being preached, you will hear the, the, there's been a lot of talk about speaking of a gospel of you need to be saved. And we assume that because someone is saved, he's reconciled to God. But the word reconciliation is a very specific term. It means fixing a broken relationship. It means to heal the breach. Now, when we speak about the gospel of uh, reconciliation, it then presumes that there was a state of being that was lost. What God, in fact, created when God made man was that he created a son. Adam was a son. God was making sons. If you study the genealogy of Adam in uh, Luke chapter 3, you will see that that portion of scripture ends up with a statement where it says, and where it gives the genealogy, it ends up with a last statement that says, Adam, the son of God. Now, when sin entered, Due to Adam's disobedience, separation came between a man and his father. And all the children of that man were separated from the father as the man himself was because of the curse that Adam's sin brought upon his children. As a result, we see that Adam introduced an environment of sin in which man cannot extract himself. And God had to extract him when the time was right. God shows us constantly in the scriptures the model by which he was going to reconcile his sons to himself. All throughout the scriptures, he gives us something like prophetic breadcrumbs telling us what he is going to do. When we come to the end of the Old Testament and we read the last two verses of the Old Testament in Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6, he tells us, this is the way I'm going to do it. Now we see that God reveals his intent to heal the breach between God and his sons, between himself and a people who would come from the race of Adam, who would be sons of God. And this is where God says, I'm going to send the spirit of Elijah. And this spirit of Elijah would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children. To the fathers. So we need to ask ourselves this question, what then is the spirit of Elijah? If we turn to 2 Kings 2 verse 5 to 13 and we read that scripture, we see the sons of the prophets who were Jericho came to Elijah and said, do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? And he answered, yes, I know it. Hold your peace. Elijah said to him, tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood to watch afar off. And the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the waters, and they divided this way and that, so that the two of them went over on dry ground. 
And when they had gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And we see then that Elijah responded to Elisha on verse 10, and he says to him, You have asked the hard thing. However, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And they still went on and talked. And behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire parted the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into the heaven. And Elijah saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now, we need to look at what was Elijah's reaction when he saw Elijah being caught up in the whirlwind after they were separated when a chariot of fire and horses came through and separated him. And clearly the scripture tells us, Elijah cried out and he said, my father, my father. So we see that Elijah, when he was taken up, was replaced by Elisha and Elisha had a double portion, a double portion of the grace that was in Elijah. That is very significant for us to note because now if we go back and we look at one, at Luke 1 verse 16 and 17, it tells us, and he will turn back and cause to return many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and incredulous and unpursuable to the wisdom of the upright which is the knowledge and holy love of the will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, and justice and disposed and placed in the right moral state. Now, we see that this is the final piece of the puzzle. We find in the in the book of Matthew, in the words of Jesus. In Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, he says, And if you are willing to receive and accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come before the kingdom. So what do we see here? Jesus says that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the prophet Elijah, who was to come. Now, the fascinating thing here is that Elijah, as powerful and as important as Elijah was, Elijah was greater because he carried a double portion. So, in a real sense, we see that Elijah was the forerunner of Elisha, like John was the forerunner of Jesus. I hope you can see this typology. And John would say, I must decrease while he increases. The sign you see of the time when God will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children is when John the Baptist came to announce Jesus. For Jesus is the one that has the double portion, for he is the firstborn. He is the firstborn of the father. So Elijah foreruns Elisha who has the double portion. And it is Elisha who is now the type of Christ, while Elijah is a type of John. But the prophecy from Malachi says the days when God would restore, would reconcile himself to his sons and would permit the ministry of reconciliation to heal the breach between God and his sons, which came up from the days of Adam and will continue until the days of Jesus. When the one who has the double portion has come that day, God will begin to heal the breach again between his sons and himself. Now, that announcement that the day has come by John the Baptist, who came as Jesus said, if you can receive it in the spirit of Elijah. He didn't say he would come as Elijah. He said he will come in the spirit of Elijah. 
So he is like Elijah who prophesies the days of reconciliation. Elijah says, when he sees Elijah being taken up, he says, his response was, my father, my father. How did Jesus respond? Jesus' response was, our father. His response was, my God, my God. You see, this is the key. This is the prophetic key of understanding us how to how God has intended through Jesus to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the prophetic key that unlocks that is the acclamation of my father, my father. You see, if we look at the ministry of Jesus, it can actually be summarized in his own words where he said, I have come to show you the father. If you look at John 14, verse 8 to 10, it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, because cause us to see the Father. That is all we ask. Then we shall be satisfied. And Jesus responded and he said, Have I been with you all for so long a time? And do you not recognize and know me yet, Philip? And then he made this proclamation. He said, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I'm telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continuously in me does his works. He does his own miracles, his own deeds and power. And we know that one of the titles that Jesus carries is that of everlasting father. Now, if we turn, if we turn to, 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 to Isaiah 9 verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, but let, look at this, everlasting Father, the eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So what do we see here? We see here that a 33-year-old man is being called the everlasting Father. So yes, in what way do we need to ask ourselves, is he the everlasting Father? And how does this restore the heart of the Father God to the children and the children to the Father? How does this work? How does this function? And the answer is very simple. Jesus responded and he said, I have come to show you the Father. Well, you might ask me, but tell me more. How do I understand this? How does he show us the Father? And it's very simple. Jesus said, I'm only doing what I see my father doing. So what is he actually saying? He's saying, it is the father who is living in me who is doing his work. The father lives in me. What does that mean? It means that Jesus provided a location in time by giving up his own right to rule and govern in his own person. He gave his person, his body, his mind, his spirit. He gave his everything to God as a complete sacrifice. And then God came and lived in Jesus by the Spirit. The Spirit would then instruct him as to what to say. The Spirit would instruct him as to what to do. So if we look at this, we must come to the conclusion that this, in his whole life, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And guys, this is the very essence of discipleship. Discipleship is not teaching somebody how to be a good church member. That's not discipleship. We may call it that, but that does not make it that. From the very beginning, we see that this is the pattern that was established by God. who discipled and we disciplined Adam so that the responses of Adam were like that of God, where he said, have dominion over the whole earth. 
and Adam began to rule the earth. He arranged the whole earth according to a kingdom arrangement. He associated the animals that went together in one order, and then another order, and then another order. He arranged the plants in the same way, things according to their own kind. And to this day, we find ourselves still referring to the animal kingdom. We refer to the plant kingdom because the one who arranged them, arranged them with the mindset and the mentality of a king. Now, you need to ask yourself, where did Adam learn this? Consider this for a moment, that he's just been made out of the dust of the earth. So where did he learn this? He learned it from his father. And Adam's father was God. And Adam learned how to arrange the world from his father, with whom he met every day until that time and moment that he fought. This is the original concept of discipleship. What we see with Elijah and Elisha, is a father discipling a son. Elijah was the father who was discipling Elisha. And Elisha's desire was to act just like his father. And we see that indeed when Elijah was taken up into heaven, Elisha cried out. His response was, my father, my father. Guys, it has always been the attention of God to use one man to show another man the character of God, the Father. This is a very order of society. The order that God established in society was patriarchal. The intention was that by a patriarchal order that a man might see the Father, that he might see Father God in the relationship that he would have had with his own human father or the Father who reminds him of God the Father. You see, a human father is supposed to remind a disciple or a son of the heavenly father. So Jesus would say it in this way. If you see me, you've seen the father because the father and I are one. In this sense, Jesus was the everlasting father in that he perfectly modeled, he completely presented with nothing left to chance, with nothing that is unfinished, he perfectly showed who God the Father was. And when they looked upon his actions, his manner of life, they did not see a 33-year-old man, for his actions were the, not the actions of the 33-year-old man, but by the standards of antiquity or by modern standards. He was not self-centered. He was not naive. He was not preoccupied with his clothing or with feeding himself, or any of those things. He wasn't bothered about his career. None of those things that so typically would characterize a 30-year-old man could possibly be said to be the way in which Jesus operated. Because at the age of 33, he had perfected the representation of God the Father. He was, if you like, the exact representation of God. Now, if we look at Philippians 2 verse 6, it says, who although being essentially one with God in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which God, which make God God, did not think his equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. You see, Jesus was the word we became flesh. But he came into the earth not to grasp equality with God or to show himself to be equal with God. He came into the earth to be the exact representation of the Father. And that is why he took on the form of a servant. He was found in the likeness of men, but he was the servant of God. He perfectly and completely and without any unfinished aspect to it, he represented and he presented the very nature and character of God the Father in the earth. And as he did it in the presence of his disciples and those that were surrounding, so that they would see how the Father was and who the Father is by knowing and seeing and walking with Jesus. You remember if we look at the book of Genesis, we read how God discipled Adam. Coming to the New Testament, we see how Jesus Disciple the twelve disciples. We see Paul discipling Timothy. 
And so it carries on as you go through scriptures in our next session. I will share with you how this manifests itself, this father and son wineskin, from Genesis up to Revelation. So if I've got to put all of this in a nutshell, then I would say that the spirit of Elijah is that thing in God that perpetuates sonship, that draws fathers to sons and sons to fathers. And our mindset are only being changed as we replace our old way of thinking and replace it with a new way of thinking. And this needs to be enhanced in us through force or some kind of motivation. You see, we get activated to change only through motivators. And the most common ones are things such as fear and love, fear of discipline, fear of rejection, fear of failure. Most of the time, this is our drivers. But I want you to know that in this season in which we are living, this is and never has been God's order that we should operate from a place of fear of discipline, fear of rejection, and fear of failure. Because God's order is one of love and of discipline, but discipline in love. So how then did Jesus obtain the mind of what is in the Father's heart? You see, it happened as a direct result of his complete and total association and unity with the Father. He became one with the Father. This speaks of coming to such a place where we associate ourselves completely with what is in the heart of the Father and allow then ourselves to be influenced and changed by the Father. We need to ask ourselves, what is it that makes us proud? When we hear the words of our dads telling us how great we are doing, that brings about an even deeper desire within us to change and to please the Father. Why? Because we love him. So in this season, we need to understand what it is that God is doing. He is calling us to that place of restoration of the father-son relationships within the body of Christ. If we are not tuned in to hear what the Spirit is saying, and if we are not connected to this sound that is being released from heaven, we will not see that manifestation of God's plan and purpose for us in this season. Therefore, you and I need to stand in an association, not only with your heavenly Father through Christ Jesus, but also in the father-son relationship that God is establishing in this season. You need, therefore, to be connected to a spiritual father in order for the fullness of Christ in you to be revealed and to be called forth through the circumcision of the flint knife of the father. In 3, 3 John 1 verse 4, it says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my spiritual children are living their lives in the truth. You see, there's no greater joy for a father than to see his children living their lives accurately and in compliance with what they have been taught by the father. So let us, again, for a moment, just turn back to where we started in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he shall turn and reconcile the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the land with a curse and a ban of utter destruction. We see this verse at the very end and the very last chapter in the Old Testament. And we see actually compressed into these two sentences, 2,000 years of God's relationship coming to an end in these sentences. But these two verses also contains a prophecy. It contains a promise of blessing but also the threat of a curse all at the same time. The promise of blessing is that the relationship between fathers and sons will be restored. 
the curse is that if there is not a turning of our hearts, that the earth will be smitten with a curse. Now, if you go to the New Testament in Romans, the book of Romans chapter 8, and I want to read from uh, verse 18 up until verse 23, um, it's important for us to just ensure that we give you these scriptures so that you can see I'm not just talking in the air. There's absolute scripture for everything and every statement that I am making. So let's read together from Romans 8 and verse 18. And again, it's from the Amplified Version. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. For even the whole creation, all nature, waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for the revealing and the disclosing of the assumption. You know, this for me is such a powerful verse in the Amplified because he's waiting for the revealing, for the disclosing of the assumption. Verse 20, for the creation, nature was subjected to frailty, to futility and condemned to frustration, not because of some intentional fault on its part, but by the will of him who so subjected it, yet with the hope that nature itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption and gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation have been moaning together in the pains of labor until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come, grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies and our adoption and our manifestation as sons of God. Let's just look at what is this saying? If we look at Romans 8 verse 19, it says, the all of creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. If we look at verse 20, it says that creation was condemned to frustration. The sin, that is rebellion and disobedience of Adam, against his natural and spiritual father brought about this place and this position where the earth is now in a place, in a position of frustration. So what does it tell us? It tells us that the order of the kingdom of God was disturbed. Let us take a moment and look at the Jewish Passover. This prophecy in Malachi was always and is still being taken very seriously by the Jewish community, community, even to this day. Because the Passover feast is still kept by millions of the descendants out of, of the Exodus. The feast time is used to remember the past blessings, as well as to look forward to future events in God's time time. You see, every year at the Passover celebration, the table setting includes one place for the coming of Elijah. An extra glass of wine and an extra plate are set aside, and no one is allowed to use it. And Abram's children are being taught to expect Elijah to come. But we know Jesus has come. Now, if you look at this hard intent of the Jewish community, as Christians, as believers, we need to ask ourselves a very serious question. And the question is that whether we as the church, do we have a place ready? Have we prepared a place for Elijah? As Christians, as believers, who are followers of the complete revelation of God, do we have a setting in the life of the body of Christ for an Elijah to return and to be welcomed? 
Both times when Elijah or the spirit of Elijah did come before, the leaders of God's people found no place for him. The question is, will the church receive him now? Are we any better than our forefathers? We see that Elijah came first in the days of Ahab. You can go and study that in 1 Kings 17. Secondly, we see the spirit of Elijah came in the person of John the Baptist. And then we see the final prophecy of the Old Testament in Malachi went through a period of 400 years of silence until we see the days of Zacharias with John the Baptist. While Zacharias, this priest of God, was performing his priestly duties, we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to him with a word from God. And this prophetic word was all about this son that was going to be born to his house and to his barren, barren wife. So what was this prophecy? It's exactly what I've read to you earlier in Luke 170, where it says, And he will himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and incredulous and unpersuadable to the wisdom of the upright in order to make ready for the Lord a people. You see, when Zacharias did not receive the word of the Lord, we see that he was struck silent, just like the 400 years before him. We must understand today, and I hope you hear me, that the church will not have a true voice until the fathers in the church receive the word of the Lord and turn their hearts towards their sons. They, just like Zacharias, they will speak full of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Luke 1, verse 67, where it says, Now Zechariah, his father, was filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So what is the dilemma of the church today? The dilemma of the church today is that the church has got a false identity. Rarely has the church received more from God than the people of the early church in Corinth did. They were planted in an apostolic foundational truth by the Apostle Paul. Then they were watered by the eloquent flow of scriptural insight from Apollos. Later they would be enriched by the testimony of the greatest living eyewitness to the ministry of Jesus in that day, which was the Apostle Peter. Corinth was a church that was indeed favored by the Lord. We see, if we look at it, it says that the church was full of the word and there was an abundance of spiritual gift. Now, considering the great wealth of revelation, of insight and charismatic expression that was deposited in this early Christian community, it would seem right to consider that this can be set up as a model of what church should become. But... Even in a casual reading in our Bibles of the Corinthian church, it reveals not a model, but a mess and a crash. According to Paul's writings, the Corinthians were a fellowship of factions and fornicators. They were a congregation of carnal charismatics. Their gatherings were an egotistical exhibition of spiritual gifts. Now, if we die, have to die off the body of Christ at Corinth, we would maybe use terms such as disunity, dysfunction, and disorder. Their ignorant use of their gifts was a symptom of confusion concerning their identity. Their Corinthians did not base their identity on who they were in Christ. Instead, they sought to establish their identity by gathering themselves under the name of one of the famous preachers. Doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, are we not seeing the very same thing today? If we look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12, it says, what I mean is this, that each one of you either says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, which is Peter, or I belong to Christ. You see, by joining themselves to a well-known name, they gained a mark of identity and kind of an elevated sense of importance, but that was not of God. 
And many of the Corinthian Christians prophesied, or they spoke in tongues, and felt not only that their gift was greater than that of the others, but also that they themselves were more excellent because of their gifting. They used the charismatic gifts as a mark of their identity instead of using it as ministry to the body, and in this way caused confusion within their congregational gatherings. And it's because of this that we see Paul writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14 to 17, where he says, I do not write this to shame you, but to warn and counsel you as my beloved children. After all, though you should have 10,000 teachers or guides to direct you in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the glad tidings of the gospel. So I urge and implore you, be imitators of me. For this very course I send to you Timothy, who is my beloved and trustworthy child in the Lord, who will recall to your minds my methods and proceeding and of course of conduct and way of life in Christ, such as I teach everywhere in each of, of, of the churches. So here we see a very, very immature church. And you see that Paul here shows the Corinthian church what is the way out of their dilemma. He reminds them that they need to become his followers since he was their father in the gospel. In the way Paul speaks to them, he speaks to them as sons and then he tells them he is sending his son in the Lord, Timothy, to bring them into remembrance. And we see that Paul is very well aware of his own identity. Because later in the very same letter, if we look at chapter 15 and verse 9 and 10, he says the following, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not fit or deserving to be called an apostle, because I once wronged and pursued and molested the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not for nothing. In fact, I work harder than all of them, though it was not really I, but the grace of God, which was with me. You see, Paul knew who he was and why he was given his place in God. It was the Corinthian church that was not receiving Paul's fatherhood. And as a result, had no true father to follow. I want you to have a clear-cut understanding of two very, very important points of this stage. As long as a congregation or a ministry stays outside of God's order of father and son, the people will have disorder and a lack of identity. Secondly, if we are without a father, then we have no name, we have no identity, we have no heritage or inheritance, and we have no true brothers. What are we? We are an orphan. You see, the order of God within the kingdom of God is the order of father and son. Paul writes here to a chaotic, charismatic culture as a father to sons, and then he sends Timothy, his son, as a model of what, in the son, what a son in the ministry is really all about. The apostle then says that this is part of Paul's way of life in Christ Jesus, as I teach everywhere in every church. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, it says, For this very cause I send to you Timothy, who is my beloved and trustworthy child in the Lord, who will recall to your minds my methods of proceeding and course of conduct and way of life in Christ, such as I teach everywhere in each of the churches. <clears throat> if we as a church are ever going to find our way out of this confusion, we must come to the place where we have to find God's ways in the kingdom. And because the church has not followed the ways of a redeemer, we've seen that the non-biblical relationship has birthed and produced 
a non-biblical generation in the church. God does not call us just as his ambassadors or as his ministers, but he calls us as his children, as his sons. We are called the church of the firstborn. We are called his bride, and we are also called his body. The condition in the church today, to a large extent, can be subscribed to immature leaders. We see that there's no fathers, but the church are operating with boy leaders. In Isaiah 3, verse 4 and 5, it says, And I will make boys their princes, and with childishness shall they rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly, and with insolence against the old man, and the lowborn against the honorable, or the person of rank. You see, when the people of God refuses maturity in Christ, they are judged by losing maturity and having immature individuals in leadership positions. We see this in the nation. We see this in the country. This principle cuts across all aspects of the, the world in which we live. Fathers are replaced with instructors. The word there is it's the Greek word for boy leader. And this terminology refers to a servant whose official position in the house was to make sure that the children went to school. So we see that fathers are actually substituted by hired servants who do not understand spiritual inheritance. A family without a father suffers. They suffer financially, socially, psychologically, as well as spiritually. What we need to see in the church is that the church must have a renewal of relational patterns in ministry. We must rediscover the wonderful truth of relationship in this order of father and son. And when we find God's order, we will know our identity and fulfill our purposes in the kingdom of God. Again, I want to emphasize the father and son relationship is the very foundational principle of the kingdom of heaven affected in and through the working of the spirit of Elijah. Embracing the spirit of Elijah is embracing the principles of father and son relationship. There must come understanding that in this season, you and I need to function in a father-son relationship. Let me conclude now by asking you this question. Who is that natural man that God has ordained in your life as your spiritual father? Do you know? And secondly, are you submitted and committed to that man as your spiritual, as your sp your spiritual father? I highly suggest this was a lot of information that you revisit this session at least a couple of times and allow this word to saturate you and to really come to full understanding. And I invite you to send me questions or anything that you do not understand. I will gladly respond to you. My contact details is on my YouTube channel. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. So thank you for listening. Thank you for really taking the time to sit down and meditate on what I've released to you today in and around this concept of father and son and the operation of the spirit of Elijah in this process. God bless you and may you have a wonderful day. Great grace to you and to your families.